a uh, good evening good afternoon good morning wherever you are and it's really a pleasure to have this uh, 78th uh, seminar of the webinar uh, series on spintronics <clears throat> so on behalf of my w2s team um, dr brasbhushan singh mr pushpendra gupta mr satyam mohanty and uh, mr ajay and others i welcome you all to this uh, seminar uh, today and now i would like to say a few lines about uh, professor andreas borger who is uh, working as the research director of cic nanomoon uh, in san sebastian spain uh, since 2007 where he is also the group leader of the nanomagnetism research group uh, dr borger received his phd with distinction in 1993 from the technical university nachen in germany where he worked on surface magnetism after receiving his physics master degree in 1989 from the university of duisburg germany from 1993 to 2001 he worked at the university of california and argon national laboratory on numerous topics related to thin film magnetism and magnet optics in 2001 he moved to ibm's almaden research center in san jose san jose in california under his transport to hitachi global storage technology in 2003 Uh, until that point, so for two years he worked at IBM Salmaden, and uh, at Hitachi, Dr. Borger was responsible for technical feasibility studies of novel thin film structures for disk storage applications and complementary scientific research efforts on novel magnetic materials. During the past three decades, Dr. Borger has worked on a multitude of scientific and engineering topics in the areas of physics and material science. at aquae wide ranging expertise in numerous research fields such as vacuum deposition technology coating of functional thin film structures surface science characterization techniques nanostructure materials and particles magnetic optical and electrical characterization of thin films multi layers and nanostructures as well as optical probe and electron microscopy in addition to his scientific work focus dr borger is also very actively involved within the scientific community as an editor for journal physics d and as a reviewer for numerous journals funding and government agencies as well as conference organizer professor borger has co-authored more than 180 peer reviewed papers in high quality journals and he is also the lead inventor on 17 issued us patents he has been awarded the research visitor fellowship uh, from american nuclear society in 1991 the feudal linen research fellowship from alexander von humboldt stiftung in 1993 the bokers medal from uh, technical university aachen in 1994 and invited guest professorship by university henry poincare uh, in nancy in france and in 2008 and 2009 as well as in 2010 and 2011 he got the mexu visitor professorship by the university that Tecnica Federico Santa Maria from Chile in 2011 as well as the Red Chile Espana in Nanomagnetism visiting professorship by the University of uh, Santiago de Chile in Chile in 2013 so uh, i have requested him to make the uh, introduction to be general for our young uh, friends and uh, as i uh, say all the time that during the lecture we don't take any questions so if you have any question uh, then kindly write in the chat box or raise your hand at the end of the lecture we will take all the questions one by one and uh, just before we take the question answer session i would request all of you to uh, switch on your camera uh, so that we can make a group photo for our souvenir and uh, then we come back to the question answer so it's all yours andreas we are really looking forward to a lecture thank you so much Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So let me share my screen here. Let's hope this works. Share. It worked earlier, so yes, that looks. So can you see it? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Very, very good. Thank you so very much. Um, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, I didn't realize you were going to 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 read the whole short bio. Otherwise, I would have sent you a shorter version to not bore the audience too much. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a delight to be here today and present some of our work to you. 
I should also um, apologize in advance because this isn't really Spintronics, as I'm not the Spintronics experts by se. It, it, I, I mean, even though I worked in related fields, it's I'm more of a magnetism person. So that's how I would consider them myself. So this is more magnetism than it's Spintronics, but maybe a kind of magnetism that'd be interested interesting for people to know that want to utilize specific or novel magnetic materials in their spintronics application. So the title of my talk is Materials with Designed. And now I cannot change. Let me just see if I can. I guess maybe I have to get out of the full screen mode. There we go. Yes, is it possible? Uh, you, you have some issues with the uh, uh, slides, so or button? Okay, no, it's all fine. Okay, please continue. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted the laser pointer. I assume you can see that, no? Yes. So, so the idea is to to talk about materials with design exchange coupling profiles, which allow us to give nanometer scale magnetization state control to materials, or you might want to call them metamaterials. So the outline of my talk, you can see here on the next view graph. But before I get into this, I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our institution here in Spain. As some of you may know it reasonably well, others will not. So I would like to say a little bit about CIC Nanoguna. I know that you have had other speakers from CIC Nanoguna. I don't know if they uh, told you a little bit about our center, but given that I'm the research director, I guess I feel a little uh, bit obligated to tell you a little bit about us. So we were founded uh, about 13 years ago, actually on Monday is our anniversary of the opening of our facilities, and we are supposed to do nanoscience in general here in what is called the Basque country, which is a region of Spain. And so in 2006, formally, a basically private entity, which is a, like a foundation, a nonprofit association was founded to create the centers. And we don't need to go to the details of the ownership here, but we are affiliated with the university, but we are not a university center. So we are formally independent, which really helped in the build up. In 2006, we got a grant from the Spanish government to, for the building of the, uh, the center. And we have been recently by the Spanish government recognized as an excellent center, which is the Maria de Maestu distinction. And this is a five year uh, program and this was just renewed. So we maintain our excellence, at least according to what the Spanish government tells us. So we, are, we were from the very beginning and given that I'm not a Spanish person or a Basque person, the idea was to have a very international centers. So why Spain in general has a lot of quite good research centers, very few are really truly international. And that was from the very beginning goal of this. So we can see we have amongst our about 100 plus people, people from 26 countries, and you see your own country is being represented here as well. So from really around the globe, we have people here. Of course, the largest group is still from Spain because most of the technical people, administrative people also are locals, because it's natural. But in terms of the research team, it's really very international. Now we have 10 research groups, the nanomagnetism group, my own is the first one. And in terms of its founding, and you can see here, Paolo Vavasori, which I understand gave a talk with you a while back. And he's a co-group leader of our magnetism group. Then we have a very successful group in nano optics, in self-assembly, which is chemistry-based nano materials fabrication, nanobiomechanics that really looks at kind of the mechanical uh, dynamics of uh, biomolecules, nano device, which is Louis Wesso and Felix Casanova as the leaders, which is actually the biggest group. We have an electron microscopy team that is not so sizable, but does mostly the electron microscopy work that we do internally, but also for external services. We have a theory group that does mostly then, uh, density functional theory calculation and nanomaterials group that is utilizing mostly atomic layer deposition are true experts there. 
a nanoimaging group that does scanning tunneling microscopy, and the newest group, which by now is a little bit bigger than the photo indicates, a nanoengineering group that's really first also looking uh, more towards applications. Now, the goal of our center is to do world class science, but we're also supposed to make a real impact. And so we have, from the very get go, uh, looked for opportunities to have spin off companies. And by now, we actually have six of those here, the first five listed. And the first one is actually by far the most successful, Raffinea, that has now almost 40 employees, one of the major independent suppliers of graphene in the world. So here you see a picture of San Sebastian. As you can see, we are on the coast here at the Atlantic Ocean. And down here, uh, when the now open still photo area, you can see our research center that is on the campus of the local university, but I, uh, which is starting right here. But as I said, formally, we are independent and a private foundation. So we have a very nice facility and that's still uh, in excellent shape. As I said, it was opened 13 years ago. We have excellent uh, laboratory equipments in the sub sub basement, which was designed to accommodate the most sensitive uh, equipment um, that is uh, utilized anywhere in the world uh, so that we have very good uh, mechanical stability, electrical stability, uh, thermal stability and so on. And then we have uh, the tower offices, mostly for our spin off companies, and then offices and other labs for equipment that don't need the most uh, sophisticated laboratory environments. So, with that, let me come back to my talk. And here again is the outline. So, I first want to give you an introduction so that you uh, will all be able to follow why one would be interested in exchange coupling profiles or the alternative terminology is graded materials. I wanna say something around the materials design, then give you some basic structural magnetic characterization information that's important for us to be able to uh, really see the effect of the exchange coupling profiles and then uh, explain to you what length scale this actually works. And that was a bit surprising to us as well that this goes down really to the very uh, small nanometer scale. And then recently we actually tried to apply what we learned uh, with our magnetic characterization to design some magnetization states and properties and really make, create kind of meta materials that allow us to tune properties uh, as we wish to, in particular, the thermal evolution of magnetization states, and I will conclude at the very end. So, so what I mentioned is this exchange uh, graded materials, so this is, falls under the overall category of graded materials, and so what do I mean with graded materials? So in general, it's always, or frequently, it's quite helpful to define something by defining its opposite. So what is not a graded material is something that is an abrupt material that has an exactly sharp atomic interface where you go from material one to the or material A to material B really on the atomic length scale. And then associated with that, you would expect that physical properties such as the magnetization or conductivity, density, or whatever you may be interested in also has a uh, rather abrupt change at that very interface. So in contrast to this, then a graded material is where by design, you now put in a layer T here in which the composition changes in a very, in a continuous fashion. Here it's shown linear, but of course it doesn't have to be linear. Uh, and thereby the physical properties also change in that linear. Uh, behavior so um, that you you have this additional design knob by basically uh, moving away from a sharp interface to a graded interface with the transition region T. Now why is somebody interested in this? Why would you care about graded materials? And the reality is it's almost impossible not to have graded material. They're actually far more common and they're difficult to avoid and I'm showing you here two examples of where one happens that one is from the semiconductor uh, technology where you look at the dopant concentration of a PN junction between boron and phosphorus. 
And you can see, well, there's a very, because this is a logarithmic scale, there's a very sharp doping profile, actually, but it's not really abrupt. It is on the order of the five nanometer range. So it has a graded structure into it. And the reason for that is, well, that's what technology allows you to do. So, and many of you uh, coming from the magnetism field may have had the task to, to grow metallic multilayers. And as you can see here, well, the multilayers grow nicely. You get a multilayer structure, but they're not atomically sharp. There's an intermixing region that generally you are unable to control. So it's difficult to avoid really uh, this graded area. You get this naturally. And uh, that this is not really um, just by design. You can see, or due to the resolution of the TEM picture, you can see the kind of the interface of the oxide layer on top. It's much sharper than what you get here in the transition region. So most cases, even if you don't want to make a graded material, um, you do make one. So, and in a way, nanoscience, I'm coming from a nanoscience center, is basically the um, science of avoiding graded materials, meaning you have really layer by layer, atomic layer control of materials and making abrupt materials possible. And actually, uh, due to a lot of hard work by many, many people, that has been achieved in a number of uh, um, areas. And as you can see here, here is a uh, um, uh, multi-layer of uh, manganite materials here uh, with the STO and in these multi-layers you can really see with this uh, TEM uh, atomically layered resolved images you can really make atomically sharp um, interfaces so you really uh, can make abrupt interfaces so that is possible and also if you look at the um, TMR sensor that you have in disk drives the the uh, length scale of that oxide is, is really almost atomically flat. It's not perfectly atomically flat because that's a real industrial mass produced item, but it's as close as one could considerably come to an atomically uh, uh, flat and abrupt surface. So that actually has been achieved due to a lot of hard work in nanoscience. So, of course, with the TMR that is related to this storage, so this was very important for uh, our, our world today because we all reliant on cloud storage because basically uh, most of your information you're not storing locally anymore, you store it uh, away from you somewhere in these uh, big cloud storage facilities, and of course our basically way of being now relies on this being available. These are some older data by now five years old, but every day, one billion hours of YouTube were watched. I'm sure this number, particular with the COVID epidemic has grown tremendously and maybe five or 10 billion hours now. And so uh, th there's a massive use for storage and that's only possible because this technology could advance really to the atomic level. So coming back to this examples, of course, what I was talking about is really structural sharpness only, because even if you have structural sharpness here uh, or here, doesn't necessarily mean that all the properties uh, change that immediately at the interface. Some of them might be, but not uh, not really to the degree in which a classical picture would see that. So we have to consider also quantum mechanics in terms of what it means to really have an abrupt material. And I show you two examples here. One is a bit older. This is a famous paper uh, from Lang and Cohen of the electron density that evolves at a surface. And as you can see, of course, the electrons don't stay in the quantum mechanical box if the box isn't infinitely high. They go outside and thereby they redistribute the electron um, uh, density, meaning even if the potential is abrupt, 
the resulting electron wave functions wouldn't be because quantum mechanics rules at those dimensions. And that makes a big impact, for instance, in the optical properties. So even if you have a perfectly clean, flat uh, surface, uh, metal surface, you cannot really describe this accurately by a single dielectric constant. And that comes from the fact that really you don't have a uniform material, you have a varying electron density, and thereby uh, the optical response now or the dielectric tensor is actually depth dependent. And typically people uh, kind of map a classical picture on this by having like a thin dielectric material on top. Uh, and so they, they use a quasi classical picture that allows you to kind of recover um, um, a classical description of this phenomena, but there is a clear limit to what abrupt interfaces can look like. Here's a famous example of work from Roland Kawakami uh, about interlayer coupling, and there in magnetism, we know this very well. Of course, a cobalt layer that's of atomic thicknesses in the monolayer range is influenced by ferromagnetic neighbors. A spin polarized uh, structure is induced into the cobalt wedge. And that spin polarized structure actually uh, brings with it this interlayer exchange coupling um, that was discovered in the, in the late 80s. So um, also here, quantum mechanics uh, tells you where there's a limit to what you can do. Um, with respect to making abrupt structures. So that's also something that's worthwhile to remember as one looks trying to make graded materials because grading only makes sense once you go basically beyond this quantum mechanical limit because otherwise you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. So why would anybody be interested in graded magnetic materials then? And this is an example of uh, some of my earlier work uh, and work of others uh, in uh, magnetic recording. And what was found that um, you can actually make a better magnetic recording structure if you combine a material that has a soft region and a hard region. And you can see this here, the hard region is the one that kind of helps you maintain the storage uh, uh, information. And the soft one allows you to switch the entire structure. So if you have this kind of structure, it actually works better than if you had an average material. So this structure uh, works better than the mixture of the two. It turns out that it becomes yet better if you don't just have this abrupt uh, interface, but instead have a graded layer in between where this high anisotropy gets gradually reduced to a low anisotropy and you couple this whole structure together. In a way, this is like a magnetic ramp that allows you to switch the magnetization even more effectively while maintaining stability in the field free case. So here graded material, and this is so-called anisotropy graded material turned out to be technologically advantageous because it had improved collective properties. So again, one has to connect this to fundamental aspects. And as I said, here one has to see what is, um, what kind of grading can we be looking for? So in metallic state, and here's another example of these quantum well states for different thicknesses, you can, depending on where you are with your energy, you can observe them to rather large thicknesses. And if you, if you in this idealized case, then grading wouldn't necessarily buy you much because the properties are kind of graded by themselves due to the nature of uh, the quantum mechanical electron wave function. Also graded against thermodynamics, and we'll talk about later, later about uh, a lot of thermal uh, properties. Um, what one has to remember is when you couple a magnetic system, and this is a picture of work by the late um, Doug Mills, where you have a material with a high Curie temperature, low Curie temperature, high Curie temperature, and you couple them all together. And this is not too different from any of the experimental structures we make. Then there is only one phase transition, basically almost where material A with the high TC would like to order. It's a little bit reduced due to the finite size of A, 
But basically at the temperature where B would order, you don't really see much anymore. And uh, there is no separate phase transition happening again. So uh, thermodynamics is of course the uh, um, limit behavior of infinitely large system. And they are also, if you were to grade these kind of structure, there is a limit to what you can do, or there should be a limit to what you can do because you're fighting thermodynamics as well as a collective description of states. So again, this, these two aspects here, the limit of what quantum mechanics tells you, the limit of what thermodynamics tells you, uh, said that there may be a limit to what you can do with graded materials. Okay. However, we figured out we want to explore this. And so let me tell you a little bit about our specific goals, what we really would like to investigate. So what we wanted to do is vary the exchange interactions of a material in a well-defined design way and understand what the impact of that is understand what the remaining thermodynamic state is, even though from the work by uh, uh, Doug Mills, it looked like, well, that really mixes everything out and there should be nothing interesting to be found. And then explore the length scale limit of where grading actually makes sense. We're also interested in the spin wave property, but we really haven't gotten very far to this. So this is something I will not talk about. And then, from what we have learned with these approaches here, we started to design some novel material properties that possibly could be of technological relevance in spintronics and otherwise. So what do you want to do now? So uh, how did we go about it? So the first thing is, so we want a gradient and that gradient should be one dimensional. So ideally we make a material where the gradient is only existent in one dimension and not in the others. So the best, as you will know, when you grow materials, the best thing you can control is what happens as you grow the material. So along the depth of the film, you can vary the properties with virtually atomic precision, whereas that's not possible in, in the two lateral uh, dimensions. So you want basically a material that has a depth gradient and is otherwise laterally uniform so that you can really observe what the depth gradient uh, does by itself in comparison to a sample where the depth gradient isn't there. So what you need to avoid are magnetic non-uniformities. And generally magnetic non-uniformities come from easy access distributions in your material and from magnetostatics. And so to avoid Point this so that these magnetic non-uniformities are not superimposed onto what that one-dimensional gradient does. Our solution was we're making uniaxial epitaxial film that have an in-plane easy axis. And so we have to make a single uh, crystal gradient film um, with our deposition techniques. And if you achieve this, in principle, the magnetostatics here should be trivial that would lead to a laterally uniform state, and then we could really see what the gradient is doing. That was our argument, and that's how we went about it. So let me talk about the specific material design, the basics and the basic structural characterization of these uh, structures there. Okay, so here's the base structure, which by itself isn't graded, uh, graded yet. So we do all our films, uh, the magneton sputtering system here, and our go-to system for in-plane uniaxial films is basically make a cobalt film with that surface uh, orientation that has a C-axis in the plane of, of the film. Now, to get that surface orientation, you have to follow this epitaxial recipe. And we're using silicon. You can use other uh, substrates. There are actually other substrates that are more suitable, but silicon is cheap. So that's an easy way uh, to do this on a, on a larger scale and not uh, spend a leg and an arm. So you grow silver on top of that, chromium on top of this, and then if you do this right, find the right uh, growth rates uh, and deposition conditions, then you get a nice single crystal uh, cobalt film that has the easy access in plane. And so if we do the XRD scan, and these are the logarithmic 
intensities here, of course, the biggest peak is from silicon, but you see all the epitaxial peaks that are supposed to be there and nothing else. And the cobalt peak actually has a very nice and relatively narrow behavior. So we can grow this structure very well. Also, its magnetic behavior now really follows this ideal um, goal that we had to have a uniform magnetic state. What you see here that may be a slightly unusual plot, this color-coded plot is the magnetization as a function of the applied field strength and as a function of the applied field angle. So if you're along the easy axis, which is at zero and 180 degree, nothing changes. You basically have full magnetization from the maximum field down to zero field because you're along the easy axis already. If you go to the hard axis, then of course you can go to saturation, but once you go below the anisotropy field, the magnetization vanishes and goes to zero. And of course you can see from the periodicity of the structure that we get, we really have 180 degree periodicity and therefore uniaxial anisotropy. And then you can try to take this whole data set and try to fit it with a single macro spin. And that, as you can see, fits the data almost perfectly well. That means our extended cobalt film sample really behaves like a single spin. And that's what we want as the base structure to be, because that means its magnetic behavior is very uh, simple, does not have a superposition of a, a lateral distribution. And therefore, anything that we now introduce in terms of graded structures should be detectable and visible. So that's a good start here. So then the first type material design that, that we did, because we expected that, well, we need to go to fairly large dimension to see any effect of the grading is that trilayer structure, where we basically started with the same structure here, but and then on top of the cobalt, we grew a cobalt chromium uh, graded structure that had kind of this uh, kind of inverse bathtub profile where the chromium concentration starts at zero, goes to maximum over a range of 80 nanometer, then is stable for 30 nanometer and then gets reversed in its uh, concentration profile. And then we put basically cobalt on top. So that's a symmetric trilayer structure. And to all our samples, we put silicon oxide for oxidation protection. So what does this uh, now do? Well, with the concentration of chromium, we weaken the ferromagnetism that's well known for a long, long time. So the saturation magnetization goes down, but more importantly for our intent here, the Curie temperature is going down with the concentration. So what we end up with, if the concentration would correspond to something that we call a local Curie temperature, and I told you before, something like a lo local Curie temperature Fundamentally, it doesn't really make sense, but we will see that practically it's a quite useful uh, um, way of looking at this. Then our sample should have this bathtub Curie temperature profile in them. Yeah, so again, this is kind of for the time being a vague concept, this local Curie temperature, but this is basically just the local exchange coupling that we think we have due to the concentration translated into a temperature scale. So these structures now we can make basically with the same quality with which we could make the single uh, cobalt film. And you can see all the uh, relevant um, peaks are here and uh, uh, we get a single nice uh, orientation for this entire stack of cobalt chromium. You can see that the position of the cobalt chromium peak here, that's the black data, uh, moves us slightly as we change the mechanism maximum concentration, which is as it should, because of course, with the concentration, the lattice parameter changes and therefore the two theta angle as well. At the same time, the full, half, uh, full width half maximum of that peak is increasing as well. And so what does that mean? Is the actual epitaxy worse as uh, we grow these samples? And it turns out that's not really the case because of course that peak here contains now, because going back to the structure here, we have a cobalt film, a cobalt chromium film, and a cobalt film again. So that peak is a superposition of all these individual peaks coming from the different depth. 
So if you consider uniform alloy samples, which we have grown as well, you can see that the peak shifts. And because it shifts, this peak now is a superposition of two cobalt peaks and, and one cobalt chromium peak that's a little more shifted. And if you take that shift into consideration, you can really map the data. So we can actually, in these graded structures, sink, achieve single crystalline, uh, high, identical quality throughout the entire concentration range. So we have consistent epidaxial quality. And of course, most importantly, we preserve the uh, HCP structure that we want to get in-plane uniaxial magnetic behavior. So we did also then the uh, azimuthal scans of our X-ray results, and they look exactly uh, as they should. You have, of course, that uniaxial uh, behavior of the in-plane scan, and that gets transferred in the epitaxial uh, uh, stack throughout the entire structure from, sil from the silicon to the silver to the chromium to the cobalt chromium, and every peak is at the right position here. So the, the magnet magnetism also works out just uh, very well. We still have that uniaxial behavior Again, this is now uh, four different samples for four different maximum concentrations that we have. And we see this 180 degree um, periodicity of the behavior. So showing this uniaxial behavior very nicely. And actually this macroscopic model fits still very, very well. Uh, quite surprising because now you have really the depth structure, but at, at fixed room temperature, um, we couldn't really see much of a difference there to just a real single layer of uniform composition. And then you can see that the, the, the saturation magnetization goes down with the uh, chromium content in the center. This is the concentration where basically you should you should lose ferromagnetism at room temperature. But of course, the saturation magnetization doesn't go to zero because you have all the other concentration and you have the thick cobalt uh, layers on the bottom and the top. So the average is still large and that's actually the weighted mean. This is what the data should look like. And indeed they do look like. And the structure stays isotropic uh, with a, a quite nice high anisotropy field so that we still have basically single domain control of the magnetic state in the lateral direction. So then we looked at the magnetization reversal. And here we noticed that now with the concentration, the magnetization reversal changes. For the lowest concentration, we actually see a complete abrupt reversal at one point because this, the, the samples are single uh, crystalline. The magnetic field is applied to the easy axis. Once one portion of the sample goes, the whole sample goes and it switches. Now at 28% uh, of uh, chromium in the center, we see a few data points appear in the middle, but that could be a fluke because sometimes you get a transient data point. So that, that, that by itself doesn't necessarily have to mean much. But if we go further with the concentration, we can see that there's really a uh, plateau building in between this. So we get really one rapid reversal and then slightly shift at the second one. Now, the interesting part is if we do magneto-optical measurements, so this is done with the VSM. So that sees the average sample, looks at the whole sample. With the MOOC uh, uh, measurements, we really look at the top layer only. And the interesting part is now all the reversals are extremely sharp. There's only one switch, not the double switch. So that means we having a laterally within the optical depth fully correlated switching, whereas the volume average really has an intermediate step. So that means there must be a difference between the top and the bottom of the sample. So we looked at this in more detail now looking at the coercivity as a function of temperature for these three concentrations. And as we change the temperature here, the coercivity of course goes up, but the transition stays sharp. Now this is actually uh, the field strength around the coercivity. It's a kind of a complicated definition here, but just that allows us to 
take that temperature dependence out and look at the transition region between the, before the switch and after the switch. And you can see within the experimental noise, the switch is, happens in one point and you go from plus one to minus one magnetization. For the high concentration sample here, we have a double uh, step everywhere and the double step really is always around zero magnetization. So the magnetization comes from large positive values, switches to a zero magnetization state and then goes uh, at a slightly higher field to a full reverse magnetic state. Now, the most interesting sample is a 28% sample where actually we see this intermediate state for high temperatures, but for low temperatures, we get this behavior where we have an abrupt change and a single switch of the magnetization um, going from full positive to full negative magnetization. So what does that mean? Now, if we now with this concept of local period temperature comes in, if we look at these data here and the temperature T as which we measure the hysteresis loop is below the lowest local Curie temperature in the system. Of course, the whole system is ferromagnetically coupled. And once one portion goes, everything goes and you get just a single switch. Now, if you move the temperature up somewhat here to this temperature, the picture still holds. The whole system is magnetically ordered. Now in the middle, because you're close to the local TC, the magnetization will be very, very small, but it's enough to really convey the uniform magnetic state and uh, the, the strong enough of a coupling so that the system goes in a uniform switch. And if you now increase the temperature further, then now you have the central portion where the Curie temperature is actually far, um, uh, or the, the actual temperature is actually far higher than the local Curie temperature. And basically you have a paramagnetic material and the power magnetic material is sufficiently far away from its Curie temperature, so there's no magnetization left. And so these two states, two parallel and anti-parallel, become basically energetically equivalent. And you can have an independent switching from the top to the bottom layer. Now, formally, bottom and top are identical, but of course, in practice, they're never exactly identical. And therefore, um, um, one switches earlier than the other. It turns out that the bottom one switches first and the second one we see with the MOOC is the top layer. So basically what we have here achieved is a temperature dependent coupling and a very, of course a very strong temperature dependence because it goes with the Curie temperature uh, relation or the disappearance of magnetism near the Curie temperature here. So we when were these types of samples now to our friends in, at NIST to do a polarized neutron reflectometry? And maybe given the time, I want to just highlight that they basically confirmed this picture. So they measured the structure and they get very nice structural uh, coherence here. Um, and you can see there's a substantial difference between four and 300 Kelvin, not here where you have the cobalt portions of the sample, but here right in the middle. Here the magnetization at 300 Kelvin really collapses, which then allows the individual uh, reversal. And so we went with the neutron scatterers through the entire cycle. And again, they so they can distinguish these three states where you have everything in the negative state, everything in the positive state, and this anti-parallel state. And so they measured really the reversal and at low temperatures, this anti-parallel state never occurs because the magnetism in the center of the structure is strong enough. But then if you go to the interesting temperature range, that changes and you can get now a probability of seeing that anti-parallel state. And at high enough temperatures, you really have like a, a field window where the whole sample is in this anti-parallel state. So that was very nice that the polarized neutron uh, reflectometry was able to confirm our inference of what happens to these structures. So these structures, however, were pretty thick. And so we were wondering how far can you take this? So we made these types of samples now switching, but it's basically the same physics from cobalt chromium to cobalt ruthenium layers. We made them 100 nanometer thick, but now we made the gradient much steeper. 
So we uh, use samples with 20 nanometer, 10 nanometer, and 5 nanometer oscillation period of the um, of the ruthenium variation. And the reason we used ruthenium was actually for the neutron scattering because that's better for them to see and distinguish from chromium. Otherwise, uh, from the magnetism point, they're both basically identical. And then we uh, looked at this like before, do we get single crystals? Yes, even with this oscillatory uh, modulation of the structure, you get beautiful single crystals. Also the single crystal orientation or the, the single crystal lattice parameters really kind of nicely in between the oscillating maximum and minimum uh, concentration in each of these cases. And uh, also the magnetism is preserved, the uniform um, uh, uh, lateral behavior, which is very important to interpret the data later. And so this all worked beautifully. And then we did neutron scattering data as well. And here you can see, this is basically the modulation peak. And you can see there's a big asymmetry in the plus plus and minus minus reflectivity, which means that actually that uh, oscillation of the structure is stronger in magnetics than in the structure. And that's the analyzed data here. Yes, because we use ruthenium, they could actually see the modulation of the structure, but actually the magnetism modulation is far more pronounced. And the nice thing is now, that just from the data alone, you can see that that modulation gets stronger as you increase the temperature simply by comparing, let's say, this data set of 50 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin, you can see that the peak goes up. That means the modulation of the magnetism must get stronger. And that's for one type of the sample. And the same happens here for the 10 nanometer sample. That means as we advance, the, or as we increase the temperature, the modulation increases as well. Now, how do we understand that? Well, this is the corresponding profiles that we extracted from there. And of course, the uh, regions of the low TC are closer um, at 300 Kelvin to TC, and therefore they fall off stronger than the other one. And that interpretation, of course, is just a confirmation of what we see in those Bragg peaks. And the same happens for the 10 nanometer sample. And now we have quantitatively followed uh, this behavior and we can really identify a Curie temperature for the low, low, low TC range. And we can follow Curie temperature behavior or the temperature behavior for the high TC range. Of course, we cannot go to very high temperatures because at these high temperatures, we would destroy the sample, but you can see they, they really de behave quite independently. And maybe I, because of the time, I don't go into the details of what we try to understand this quantitatively, which is a bit of a hand-waving instrument. So we use some mean field theory of kind of an expanded exchange coupling. But if we compare this to the data, we can understand the difference between the TCs here and there. And from that extract what the length scale is in which the magnetism starts behaving independently. And there are two different ways of analyzing the data. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details here, but what the outcome is, is that these films show kind of a local thermodynamic behavior of any length scale that's about, that's larger than one to two nanometers. So even though formally it's one Curie temperature, it's a fully exchange coupled system to the entire structure, they behave as if it's really the local exchange coupling that determines what samples do thermally. And that came as a big surprise to us. We didn't really think that that would happen, that this is actually such a local behavior um, but it is what the outcome is, and this is a, a quantitatively consistent interpretation. Now, there's good news here, because that means now you can really engineer and put things together uh, on the one nanometer scale and really have kind of a local property. Remember that I told you, well, you want to design your materials, but there's a limit to that because quantum mechanics and thermodynamics start intermixing things that are far away from each other, just to the sheer nature of thermodynamics and, of course, the delocalized electro wave function. But at about one nanometer or two nanometer, that actually stops 
being relevant and really you have local properties that you can now define and design. So let me give you a few examples here of the design magnetization state and properties. So here we made a different profile of now the local Curie temperature or the local exchange coupling constant high on one side, a little low on the other side, and then a gradient in between that goes below the lower end. So what happens here now as a function of temperature? And again, you see the magnetization as a function of applied field and temperature here. And basically here you have one hysteresis loop at high temperatures because only that side of the sample is ferromagnetic. Here, the, whole, the temperature is low enough, everything is ferromagnetic and kind of this gradient disappears. It has almost no effect anymore. But in the middle, you really see there's a second transition because now this is ordered. This side starts to order from there, and, but it's only has this very uh, narrow paramagnetic regime in the middle. So it's quite independent. So the magnetism has an onset coming from one side, it switches independently, and then the other one comes. So as a function of temperatures, now we have single layer to multi-layer to single layer behavior. So we actually have a non-monotonous change that we can design. More interestingly, if we look at the, the, the uh, coercive field of this kind of structure, the coercive field here, but this is a negative branch. So the coercive field goes up with lowering temperature here, where you have that single layer behavior. It does so on the low end temperature side, but in the middle, you have a perfect, almost perfect plateau of the coercive field. So if you look at these data and compare them to a sample in which that top layer is missing, in the top layer where the top layer is missing, you just get the coercivity increasing with decreasing temperature. But in this design trilayer structure now, you really have a, almost 70 Kelvin, which is one third of the total range, temperature range, in which the coercivity changes by less than 1%. So with simple or common ferromagnetic materials, you can make very uncommon temperature dependencies for key properties like designing a perfectly stable coercivity. So this is one example. Another one where we just used a gradient structure is um, that um, we can actually suppress coercivity altogether. So for high temperatures, of course, the sample isn't ferromagnetic. It starts ordering from this side here. But now depending on the slope, you have a strong paramagnet right next to the ferromagnetically ordered structure. Now, if the gradient is very steep, then you're having this left side behavior. So this S is the steepness and you have kind of a normal behavior. The magnetization comes up and coercivity comes up. And at 85% of course uh, of TC, you see a normal hysteresis curve. But if this slope is very shallow, then the strong power magnetic regime is actually quite extended. And you get this behavior at 85% of TC where there is no coercivity. So you have a, the same kind of ferromagnetic behavior up to zero field, but it switches in zero field essentially, or we didn't manage to, to measure coercivity. So the onset of ferromagnetism happens at the Curie temperature, of course, but the onset of coercivity happens only about 20% lower than that. So you can really design a ferromagnet that at least in a, a certain, um, temperature range, which is quite considerable, about 20% of TC is hysteresis free. And it's anisotropic too. So that's quite interesting that you're able to do this. And so let me look at the last example here where we have a triangular design. So the, the ferromagnet should order in the middle, but now again, it depends on what happens with the slope. What we wanted to do is really play with the kind of a thin film geometry versus kind of surface behavior of ferromagnetism. And depending on the slope, we can now for large slopes, we get kind of the conventional behavior that mimics the homogeneous sample. But if we make very shallow slopes, we really go more to an extended surface transition. And you can see the onset of ferromagnetism becomes very, very different. 
So we actually can manipulate the phase transition and the onset of, mag uh, of the temperature dependent magnetization and hereby basically suppress universality because the system should be defined only by the dimension of the order parameter and the dimension of the system, but it's not. If we use this nanoscale uh, structural uh, device, we can actually vary um, the onset of magnetization. And what surprised us the most is the scaling actually is preserved. So if we take multiple uh, field dependent data, we get perfectly scaling properties. Uh, we get a very good fit to the scaling function independent of what the slope is, but the critical exponent for the magnetization changes dramatically. And it changes from uh, just under 0.5 for the homogeneous system to almost the, that value plus one, so 1 1.4 in this case. So we have a very broad range in which we can modify the critical exponent that we didn't even think is possible. And I think I'm not sure theory allows for that, but experimentally, that's what we observe. So with this last example, maybe I skip the summary and conclusion, given that I have talked for 51 minutes already, but maybe just point out again. So with this, what we learned that actually thermodynamics is defined on a very short uh, length scale in ferromagnetism and one to two nanometer uh, defines of what the magnetic state is. And with that, you can really modify the temperature dependent magnetization and coercivity behavior. And uh, in structures that are fully ferromagnetic, they're nanoscale structures and they're fully ferromagnetically coupled. So um, they're really a, a new metamaterial, but with completely changed uh, properties. And so we hope that this may be interesting for many applications. And with this expressing this hope, Maybe I should conclude my talk and should thank the key people that uh, did all this work. I want to mention two people uh, specifically, Lorenzo Fallarino, who actually started this work as a PhD student. And he came up with uh, trying this after he had seen a talk at the conference. And now Mikael Quintana, who's a PhD student with me, who's continuing this work among some other projects that he's doing. Shouldn't forget the Basque and Spanish government supporting uh, our work and with that I thank you all for your kind attention. Okay, thank you so much uh, Andreas. It's wonderful uh, lecture overview of very interesting uh, set of uh, materials. So I clap on behalf of everyone. Uh, before you. we take the question answers, I have also some questions. Uh, I request you to stop sharing the screen and I request all of you uh, to switch on your camera, if it is possible, then we will take a screenshot, uh, just so here, and then we will, uh, after that, come back to the question answer. Okay, yeah, I think I stopped sharing, if I did this right. Yes, uh, now I yes. see, uh, yeah. Hi, Dale. And other friends, yes, of course. Okay, so I start to take pictures, so smile. In one screen, we can have only 50, and we are now like 60 people. So, uh, please turn on your camera. All right, thank you so much. You may kindly um, stop the video and uh, you can share your screen again, Andreas, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so let sure. me begin uh, with, the, uh, uh, with some questions. Uh, and while others I request, either you write the question in the chat box if you want me to read it for you in case you have a microphone issue or so. And if you want to ask yourself, just raise your hand and I will uh, come back to you. Okay, so uh, in the beginning of the talk, uh, you showed this grading thing, which is a very clever way of uh, doing it. I wonder from where the anisotropy is getting uh, induced. Do you apply a magnetic field or it's the oblique angle of incidence or whatsoever it is? 
Are you referring to this one here, the graded, this one? Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, this, is, this is basically done due to the platinum content in the material. I, in, I mean, in real recording uh, media. So what you do is the hard magnetic layer, which is typically the, the one that's far away from the recording head, um, typically has a platinum content of, I don't know, 16, 14%. And then here you use a material that has a much lower platinum content because it, it, the anisotropy in these cobalt, platinum, chromium, boron alloys is dominated by the platinum content. And so, and then here you really kind of uh, make a yeah, magnetic ramp by varying the platinum content in a multi-step type way that effectively due to some natural intermixing ends up uh, like a graded um, anisotropy structure. Okay, so the anisotropy is basically coming because of this cobalt platinum hybridized interface. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And well, uh, no, no, but it's not the interface. It's really an alloy, right? It's a cobalt okay. platinum alloy. That yeah, but I mean, uh, we know the uh, let's say the L one zero ordered uh, structures of this uh, sure. iron platinum, cobalt platinum. They have very high anisotropy because of this. Okay, some hybridized states. Uh, it's not interface between one layer to the other, but uh, because of the elemental hybridization, you can say. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, in uh, towards the end, where you have uh, showed some very interesting results um, on these uh, graded structures, but you said that hysteresis is free. So I wonder how it is a ferromagnet and uh, free of hysteresis. So what is the mechanism behind that? Yeah, exactly, that's like this. Yeah. Can you kindly explain a little bit? Yeah, so actually I started to work on this while I was in industry already, because basically, in a way, this is what you would want. You want something that, well, not, not quite that, but you want something that switches easily, but maintains the structure. And there we already had the idea. And actually, I think that's one of the patents I have where you put the ferromagnet right next to a material that's also a ferromagnet, but with a TC lower than the operating temperature. So if you make this profile very, very shallow here, yeah, then you have a, a small portion of the sample that's in a ferromagnetic state. So you have a ferromagnet altogether, but you have a large segment of the sample that is a paramagnet very close to its Curie temperature, or a ferromagnet, but with a temperature that is just above its local Curie temperature. And therefore you have an incredibly large susceptibility here. And it's that susceptibility of the strong paramagnet that basically flips with the field and therefore pulls the ferromagnet around. Does that make sense? Because this is a ferromagnetic material. It's ferromagnetically coupled all through. But part of the material has a TC, a local TC, local exchange coupling that it's really in a ferromagnetic state. And then the magnetic state falls off kind of exponentially here. But be, it, that's what happens in any kind of material. But if, it's, if the gradient is shallow enough, that fall off is very, very slow. And therefore you have a big chunk of the material that's a paramagnet, but with incredibly high susceptibility that's fully coupled to your ferromagnetic portion. And therefore, even if you have a very small field, it pulls everything around and you're switching to the other side. So the coercivity cannot be absolutely zero, but this was done in our squid and with the resolution we have, we could not measure any coercivity. Okay, so it's like very, very soft magnetic, isn't it? Like formaloid or so. No, 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 it's, it's uh, um, this cobalt ruthenium. Okay, so it has very high magnetization. It has a substantially high magnetization, okay. but it is the fact that it's a ferromagnet that's just below the temperature where it, uh, uh, just above the temperature where it would order by itself. And therefore, well, the susceptibility formally diverges and okay. therefore it can pull anything in the field direction, including okay. the adjacent ferromagnet. 
all right and i see you have measured at 85% of the at the i mean at the temperature like nearly 85% of pc but if you go much lower temperature then still you get uh, the blow no, no. up this is this is no no this is this graph here as you can see so the magnetization sets on at tc but the coercivity doesn't set on until about i think it's 82% of okay. the coercive field and once you add 82%, then the coercivity comes in. So it's not forever. Yeah? So, but it's, a, it's, it's not a minute effect. It's almost 20% of uh, the entire ordered uh, range. So that's a very substantial uh, temperature range. And what is the TC of this material? The TC of this material, um, I think it was around 250, but that doesn't really matter. The TC of the, I mean, you can do the, des the design at 400 Kelvin, at 500 Kelvin. Yeah. We, did it, we did it at about 250, so we can measure it nicely with our squid. But oh. this is just, just for experimental purposes. There is no fundamental limit to this. Yeah, so because you, if you want to use it for any application, then obviously you have to tune more than the room temperature. So, but you sure. can do that. Okay. So, yeah. thank you. Uh, before I ask more questions, uh, uh, I take the question of uh, Smithy. Uh, she is asking, my question is a little general on why magnetic properties can be improved or changed by moving to multi-layer systems from a bilayer system of hard and soft materials. Okay. You can see that also in the chat box. Uh, okay, let me let me just read this. I'm not in general. Why magnetic can be improved, changed by moving multi-layer systems from bilayer system. Okay, yeah, so. Uh, this is a kind of, I think I, I probably don't have the view graphs to explain this in sufficient detail. So I go back to this because this is the. So, first of all, um, <clears throat> it is um, basically what I try to indicate here that, that, um, um, that helps this exchange spring effect. So what happens is if you were just to mix those two materials, let's just say this has an HK of 10 and this of five, you would end up with a material that has an HK of 7.5. Now, because you allow this non-collinear states to occur, because when I apply five kilos, that the soft material already rotates a lot. And therefore, it actually can put some torque onto the hard layer and pull it away from its easy axis. And so that combined effect allows you uh, this non-collinear state in the transient magnetization reversal allows you to lower the coercivity from the average being 7.5 kilo or stead to 6.5 kilo or stead, for instance, depending on the dimension. Yeah, so you need this non-collinear state to occur in the interface to make this improved collective behavior. Now, the um, detail of how this happens, of course, has something to do with the exchange coupling constant in the interface and the anisotropy gradient. And so what you can do when you have this multi-layer you can really optimize the structure so that you form a quasi-domain wall, and that makes the process yet more effective. Yeah. So while you can go from 7,500 maybe to 6,500 Ersted in coercivity, when you can now adjust uh, the structure, so you get basically this 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 non-collinear structure on the right length scale you can go to 5500 earth and therefore in, for the same stability point and therefore you can adapt basically this non-collinear state to the optimum uh, structure that it would have if you can design a material and therefore this graded structure works yet better than this bilayer structure which by itself already works better than an average material i hope i answered this question yeah i think it's probably one of our uh, okay see that it's something again so it means like helping the abruptness in one sense 
Yes, in this case it does. Yes, in this case it actually does, and that's that's what I uh, yeah tried to ex explain in the beginning. In most, I mean, I, I went from kind of solid state physics more to materials physics and interest in industry, and maybe now moving a bit back to uh, condensed matter physics. In materials physics, what you're trying to do is really make abrupt interfaces to demonstrate that you have the control. But in terms of what you want to do, it may not be always the best. However, if you cannot make this abrupt interface to start with, you don't know if this is really what's happening here. So you have to start uh, with an abrupt interface in terms of really understanding the ongoing physics or verifying what's happening. And then it turns out, oh, if we make the interface yet less abrupt, it actually works better. Yeah? But to get to that knowledge point, you really have to have the control of a kind of abrupt interfaces to begin with. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I hope Sridhi got it. If not, uh, let us know. Uh, Arbind, uh, please uh, unmute and ask. Yeah, thanks for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, I have a question that I think you have not covered for this, but I would just like you comment on uh, application of such materials uh, for the spin waves you mentioned that it could be interesting in the beginning. Oh, the spin wave. Yeah, so this actually there's a paper out by other groups that I kind of took on our um, our designs and there, there are a number of interests interesting properties um, uh, related to spin waves, but also others, because if you make this kind of graded structure, you also kind of lose the symmetry, yeah? So with spin waves, of course, you having these uh, Damon Eschbach modes that are uh, located uh, more towards one surface or the other. And if you make the surfaces unequal, they also become unequal and actually uh, show uh, a different left to right propagation difference. In addition, of course, you're losing kind of translational or inversion symmetry if you grade the material. And so there, there's actually the, the possibility that you have jalousinsky moria interaction in these kind of graded materials. Now, again, this is graded uh, uh, anisotropy that I'm showing here, but basically that, that is true for all kind of graded materials using the inversion because now this side is not the same as this side. So that inversion symmetry is broken. So in principle, you could have the lucinsky moria interaction. And again, for the, for the spin waves, now the ones that are located at opposite ends of the interface or have a depth structure that is not uniform, basically they will see the graded structure and depending on where their largest uh, amplitudes are, in conjunction with the graded uh, uh, magnetization will show different properties than the ones that avoid those areas. So um, basically you can use that also to tune uh, the spin wave structures that you, you have in these materials. But actually experimentally, um, we haven't done that yet. We did one attempt with real light scattering, but we got very broad peaks because we were trying to, to use relatively hard materials with platinum in there. Then the peaks got so broad that we didn't see very much. But, uh, and I'm not aware that people have actually done a lot of experiments on that, but they have been theoretical predictions based on our work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arvinda. I think uh, we don't have more questions. So uh, very nice interactions. Uh, just to tell others and students, uh, if you have uh, any more questions, I'm sure you can write to Professor Andreas Berger and you will be happy to answer. Uh, Andreas, you can stop sharing your screen. I would like to share my screen to present you a small digital memento. Uh, there we go. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so it's small uh, token of appreciation from our team. Uh, I will read it. Uh, so W2A seminar, webinar series on spin tonics, uh, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, Nice of Goodness for India, takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Andreas Parker from CIC Nanogun uh, in San Sebastian, Spain. 
in recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on materials with design exchange coupling profiles. Thank you so much, Andreas, for this excellent lecture. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Uh, nearly 50 people are listening to it right now. And it's really uh, nice. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope Thank to see you so much for the invitation again and uh, the opportunity to present them. Uh, yes, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to contact me. And uh, it was a pleasure to be part of this event. Thank you so much. So I wish you good, good health. Uh, please take care of you and your daughter and family. And all of you also wish you good health. Uh, next week, uh, we most likely meet at this time, but one, the speaker next week has some issues. Um, but I will come back to that in a few days. Uh, this is a difficult time. So let's see. So until then, uh, I wish you good night or good day. And uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye to everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Wolfgang.